tournament preview again. Uh, Seahawks, Rams. Look at this, folks. Number 51 in your program, number one in your heart. Lofa Tatupu is joining us here on the opponent preview. Lofa, how are you, man? I'm blessed, man. And you forgot the Johnny Utah. That's another good oh, one. Right? Johnny Utah there me as too. well. Two. <laughs> yeah, give me two. Um, well, I, we're going to get into it because you got beer, too. We're going to promote your beer, too. You right you got baby. your hands into everything right now. Yeah. I want for people that don't know, and there's probably like one or two people that don't know what you're up to. Tell I want you to tell everyone this post NFL playing career what Lofa Tatupa's been up to. But what have you been up to right now? You've got your hands in everything right now. Media, beer, all of it. Yeah. So I start with the media, podcasting. Um, been doing that the last several years, all day podcast. You can Follow us on YouTube. It was started by the great G. Scott and K.J. Wright. And nice. um, as they moved on to other endeavors, G. Scott's got the reset of his own show. And then K.J., of course, he's uh, he's coaching the the Niners. But we won't talk too much about that. But I'm grateful <laughs> for the opportunity, right? So, But I, what I love about podcasting is media on your terms. You get to be yourself. You're not censored, right? You know, no. we, do, we were swearing just a couple minutes ago because – we're just regular people. We're real dudes. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, podcasting, um, got into the cannabis space, 1937 Farms out in um, Duval, Washington. So um, got a brand over there. We're expanding. We uh, built five more hybrid greenhouses for expansion. One of my buddies, fellow uh, Seahawk, Matt McCoy, he's uh, heading that that up, that project up, him and Jeff McCoy. And then uh, so that brand is probably around, you know, we're going on seven, eight years. It's starting to get big and, and catch catch uh waves so huh. uh, what else and then the beer savage brewing you know um they uh out in kirkland uh I, we launched a beer for a charity for parkinson's some that has hit home to my family as well as will savage the owner of the brewery and it did really well and then we decided to make a go of it and so this year we just launched two new beers uh mine is the pilsner i'm gonna say it's the best right i have to and then that's 51 Savage. And then uh, 31 Savage, Cam Chancellor, maybe you've heard of him. He's got the hazy IPA, and it's probably one of the smoothest hazies I've ever had. Okay. And, and, and then we've got the man with the gold jacket, the GOAT, the best to ever do it, Walter Jones, 71 Savage. His is a lager called Big Malt Jones. <laughs> that is a great name. Yeah. That is a fabulous name. That is unbelievable. So been busy, and then I got two boys, thirteen and ten. Uh, and they keep me very busy. They're starting to get into sports, and um, oh man, you know I get to take it back to the days, you know, because everybody, all the kids that I get to talk to, they're just like, you know, what's it like being an all pro? Like, well, you don't. The, the story didn't start that way. I was sitting on the bench for several years, waiting for my opportunity to start, and in those years, I was working and just trying to become a starter. And so, you know, we all we all didn't, you know, come out the womb like. Camp Chancellor and Big Waltz, you know, just monsters, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, biggest, fastest, strongest uh, at their position. You know, I uh, and I know they had to work, but they, I had to work extra hard uh, at my height and weight. <laughs> what uh, your boys, 13 and 10, are they are they into football right now? What, what are they playing? Um, the oldest is um, it's funny. You know, he wasn't into football until we took him to a Friday night light, something with the Seahawks. And um, they go to a high school game. So me and Trufant took him to a high school game and he saw the lights and he heard the band and right in the pack stands. And then a group of cheerleaders walked across and I just saw his head turn. <laughs> and he looked at me and mom and said, I'm definitely playing football. Yeah, he, he is. And we were like, well, kid, like, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. You don't even Those are the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, mom was a cheerleader at my high school. And that's yeah, well, how I guess, I guess, yeah, it, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But um, he's getting into it. He uh, he played some flag football. He's a big kid. He's already taller than me at 13. He's wow. six, six foot, 185, big boy. <laughs> and um, so now I'm just, the fun part is I'm making him get up and do workouts. And I'm like, okay. We're going to find out if you really want this. And uh, and so, and then the 10 year old, but the 10 year olds into arts and coding. And we, so we sign up for a code ninjas class over in uh, the commons in Newcastle. And uh, it's the first thing I've ever seen them just stick to, right? Like I would, it was a two hour class. I was worried it was a little too long for his attention span at 10. 
he loved it and was ex excited to go back to the next thing. So, you know, sports isn't for everybody. I'm going to make him play a sport eventually just to learn teamwork and accountability and, you know, just being part of something bigger than yourself. But, but um, yeah, all the life skills it teaches you. But other than that, just having fun with them right now. But it's, you just got to do something, right? I mean, that's that's the thing with kids. You just don't want them sitting around being idle. Just what, whatever it is. It's sports, it's arts, yeah. it's music. Just something to keep you occupied. Absolutely, brother. He's a big time gamer. And I'm like, well, well you know, someone made that game. So well, if it's your passion, then we're going to chase it and you're going to develop video games. And you're gonna, one day you're going to turn around and say, I made that game that some kid or a bunch of people are playing. Right. Take it. Take it as far as you can. Well, Lofa Tatupu is with us all day podcast. You can check it out on uh, YouTube. It's also on all the podcast platforms. Uh, and you do it with uh, the guy you do with Brett. He's from yeah. here, right? Edmonds, homegrown. Edmonds, Washington. Um, he uh, he left around 18, 19 years old to pursue an acting career. Went out to New York, did a bunch of shows out there, and then made his way to uh, to Hollywood and was on a bunch of big uh, MTV's Awkward. I guess that was a very long, big show. So yeah. we were walking around the suites because um, he comes to every home game. And, you know, people were stopping like, oh, my God, Jake Rosati. That was his character <laughs> on the show. And um, so, yeah, people taking pictures, autographs. But it was funny. So we get into the Seahawks, the hand of the legend suite where we're sitting. And um, he's walking around. He's like, this is awesome. The young lady that was... Uh, work in the suite. She recognized him. She's like, can I get a picture? And, you know, I, I walked, I was like, with me? And then she's like, no, him. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh... it's like, people know me up here. And I was like, yeah, I know they do. But then it's funny because he turned around and he went to ask a gentleman a question that's just in the suite. He walks up and he forgets how to talk. And he's looking at Mario Bailey, Husky legend. And, <laughs> and so I'm like, Brett, wake up, man. He's like, it's, it's Mario Bailey. I go, yeah. I go, he he runs this, man. Like, this is, this, and so he just couldn't believe it because he he grew up watching him, right? And, wow. uh, and Mario, one of the ultimate legends around here, man. So it's Great just dude. cool. It's cool to see it all come into life and, and we're having fun with it. All right. So you got, you got, you got the Savage Brewery. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the cannabis farm's name again? 1937 Farms. 1937 farms. I mean, you just got everything. You are a, a real renaissance man is what you are. Well, you know, and I didn't graduate college. I went, I went to, went there to play football and I left uh, for a job to play football up here. But like, I, huh. I found that, you know, the more you are willing to try and learn, right. Cause it's all been a learning process. And, uh, but the, I think that's been the exciting part about it. Just, you know, continuing to grow, you know, as, uh, as a business person, you know, and just, um, you know, a leader too, um, just working with people. I think I, you know, leading teams as a captain is very similar. And, yeah. um, I think it's, yeah, those skills that I was able to acquire from other great leaders have helped me well, uh, in the transition of trying to find out I'm just doing things that I enjoy doing. And like right now, uh, I just left, um, uh, BMW Northwest BMW and we're going to do a little like uh commercial for them so like me and, and one of my producers Michael who uh he does the video work and everything he's shooting it and I'm just writing these scripts and we're just having fun with it and I think that's the the most important thing is do stuff that you love yeah good for you man that's that's awesome keep you keep your fingerprints over every uh, over everything and everything Lofa um all right help us out what's going on with them what's going on four and four I mean, they're not as good as when they started off three and zero with with you know because you got to you got to factor in the opponents that they had and yeah. and all of that. But they're certainly not as bad as as you know they go on that losing streak uh, where they drop three straight. But four and four after after eight games, um, what what are they in for? You being on the field, what what do you think they're missing right now? I think an identity, to tell you the truth. Um, for as hard as they've fought, and as much as they shocked us going three and zero, and then just as drastically shocked us going 0 and 3. I think we could chalk that up to injuries, which is an excuse. I mean, we were decimated by injuries, but then also having three games in 11 days, there's five or six other teams that are going to have that stretch of games. And um, I'll be interested to see how they fare schedule or uh, record wise when that ends up happening. But, um, you know, then we bounce back and we go down to Atlanta, a game they gave us no chance in the Falcons were red hot coming off a three game winning streak. 
And we, you know, walked into their trap, take over their trap. Like that was, uh, it was beautiful from start to finish. Most complete game I saw. And um, just, we have to start building on these things and learning from these experiences. But I'll tell you the one thing that has been just to our detriment, penalties, and then the turnover battle. Mm -hmm. Like just cleaning those two areas up will change the entire outcome because when we played the Niners, I brought up everybody's like, oh, you know, they, they beat us again, which, yeah, it's four or five straight times. It's tough. But you look at it, there was three turnovers, and the 49ers had zero. We had nine penalties. The Niners had five. Those numbers should result in a 20-plus point win. We, only, we were in that game. It ended up being a 12-point loss. We flipped that whole scenario down in Atlanta, and we won by 20 points down in Atlanta because we had – Nine, we had nine penalties, or they had nine penalties, we had five, and we had three turnovers, they had zero. And so just those little factors, the details of protecting the ball and not hurting yourself, because that's what Holmgren always said, it's hard to win a game in the NFL, do not give them any help. Right. And they do, they, there's a lot of, you know, if you even go back to into the Bills game a little bit, Lofa, like you, you think about it, as you know, as poorly as they were playing at times, you look at those two trips inside the red zone and go, yeah. like in an alternate crazy universe, Yeah, they're up 14 to 7 and a half playing like absolute dog shit. <laughs> I mean, think worst, about that. Yes, playing the worst ball possible. Yeah. It's, you know, but it's those little things, you know, it's, you know, the, the snap goes over the head. You snap, you snap, you know, the, the center yeah. steps on Geno Smith. I mean, I've never, like, I, I mean, I've seen that stuff happen. I've never seen it happen in the same game, like back-to-back -back possessions. Oh, man. It was wild, right? And then even couple that into we get down there on their two-minute drill, and Josh Allen, actor of the year, give him, just give him the Oscar for that flop. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, because he's – Yeah. I, he might be bigger than Derek Hall. And, uh, and he just, you know, he took it – literally took it on the chin and laid back and, you know, laughed as he got the penalty. But – you know, because you're allowed two steps. I saw two steps and then a hit, and then it just the the helmet to helmet's going to get called. But yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just I want to take it up with the competition committee about why is a play that's illegal shift or illegal motion allowed to continue, and we're resulting in another penalty that's negating everything that just happened that the offense messed. That's up. what I'm saying. I I don't understand why the the play just doesn't stop. Right. Blow the whistle. Yeah, I, I, that was yeah, that was that was. Uh, you brought up the the Reed and Hall stuff. I mean, just there's a, there's a lot of people watching this and listening to this. I mean, they don't, they've never been in that, they've never been in that arena. They may mm -hmm. have played high school football, yeah. uh, but nothing, and they've probably experienced something like that if they did. Uh, this stuff happens all the time, especially at, at the at oh. the pro level. Um, it's not uncommon. Did you see anything different about it? Like sometimes the one thing I noted, at least this Lofa, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you see this stuff happen on the sideline. You don't ever really see it happen on the field all that much. Was, was yeah. that a difference or, Hey, this is kind of business as usual. This happens more than you think they were fine. They, and they've talked about how they, they were fine afterwards anyways. Yeah, no, it does happen more than you think. Um, but you know, as soon as, you know, it's two alphas just going at it, yeah. man. And, like, you know, they're in the heat of battle, and it was just – it was an, a horrible play that we're going to learn from. You know, Hall's a smart kid, but he's an intense competitor. And I think, you know, just the way uh, maybe Reed said it, and or even – I don't know if he put his hands on him or what, oh, but it's wow. – you know, and now – my my whole thing is like okay, there's a hierarchy here, and like that's got to be respected as a young player, um, like because any time when I was a rookie, even though I made it to the Pro Bowl, Bryce Fisher, Grant Wistrom, you know Ken Hamlin, any of them said something, you shut up and listen, right? And that's really what it, it, what I'm talking about here is like, all right, this is a nine year veteran, and he's already paid his dues and earned his stripes, and uh, and Hall's a terrific player. He's going to be you know, I believe of a Pro Bowl caliber and a great player. Um, but this is, you know, this is a time where you just got to sit back and you just have to, okay, like he did make a mistake. Do we pile on? Like this is where temperaments, you have to know your personnel as a leader too. So we both have fault here in this, both Reed. And uh, and I spoke to Jay Reed after the game. I was like, hey man, like I'm never going to question your your leadership style. It's just, um, you know, we all know he's, he's the top dog. But, um, you know, some of these kids, you know, 
Hall didn't come from a national championship. I think Jay Reed had two or three national titles, right? And like, so there's an expectation in terms of the standard in Reed's mind that maybe some of these other guys have not gone through um, as a young player in the league, but also in college, you know? So I'm just, I just told him, hey, you know, you got to give a little grace to to these young guys, but also, you know, make sure um, the way you approach them is the way you'd want to be approached. From the from a defensive standpoint, what what you've seen here from from McDonald and, and watching these players and and then watching what they're trying to execute, what, what are they not firing on? What, what what is it when you when you look back and, and watch this? Yeah, I think sometimes maybe we're staying, and I got to look at the numbers, uh, but I'm just saying from my eye, um, you know, we I would put eight defenders in that box until we prove we can hold somebody under 150 yards. There's five teams out of eight that have gone for 150. So I don't know who we think we're kidding or disguising by staying deep. If we're eight man front, just stay eight man front. Just tell the corners to back up a little and get ready top down. You know, we're, we're, you know, don't give up the deep ball, which it's a lot of pressure on them anyways. But when you have, Five teams out of eight going for 150 yards. If you don't get that addressed and you don't get that stopped, it's just going to be, they're going to be open to anything. Play action's easier. Everything works at that point. Like it's, um, and you know, it's kind of what I feel for Grub. Like if you don't have the run game going, what are you supposed to do? But just stand on the defensive side. There's sometimes I thought we were just a little out of position, maybe disguising a little too much, even just the simple cover two where they hit that honey hole shot um, past Job. That's not Job's fault. But we had um, Witherspoon was down in the in the curl, and he jetted back to be the top safety. Josh Allen's going to find that. As soon as he sees what we're doing, it's like 1,001. With that, okay, I know where to go with the ball, and he's got a cannon for him. It was a beautiful pass, but everyone's going to say, oh, that's on Job. It's not. It's really on the safety, whoever has to play the safety, which that was our curl player. It was a crazy rotation. Spoon comes back. Um, the uh, middle backer turned over to curl. The other guy went to curl. And then Julian Love, who was in the curl, ran deep middle. So it's um, almost an inverted cover three of sorts. But um, I just – it's it's doing too much or asking too much with our disguises to try to fool Josh Allen, where if we just line up, even if he knows it, it's like, okay, now show us the perfect pass while we're in position. So, sounds like you're kind of hinting at that, that at least for these guys right now, that the defense can at times be too complicated. Um, I, I feel like they have a great understanding of it, though. I feel okay. like maybe as players, we're getting a little too cute with our disguises and alignment. Does that yeah. make sense? Because I don't – the way they were able to move all those, because I was like, did I just see that right? And then I looked up at the board. I was like, that's exactly what they did. I was like, wow. I, to get – five or six different guys comfortable enough to do that because when John Lynch was with, um, what was it? Denver, they were a good enough defense and they were doing stuff like that. And I was, I haven't seen that in a long time. So mm -hmm. like the understanding of the principles is there. I just feel like I'll take it a step further. So in coverage, there's a couple times where it was third and four or third and five and we're seven, eight yards off of the, uh, the receiver that's pitch and catch. Like, Okay, you can line up there, but you better be attacking to four or five yards on the snap because that's where interceptions, especially in zone, happen. But Josh Allen is capable of picking up and just throwing it to the open guy, even 30 yards out to the sideline. If he's on the right hash and they're all the way far left hash and it's 10 yards down the field, he will rip that thing in there if you are two or three yards off in coverage. He That's that kind of arm talent he has. So just I want to see them challenge him more, and I think that's where people were getting on Spoon and they were getting on um, – Joe, when they did get beat a couple times, but if that's any fraction of a bad throw, that's an interception going the other way, kind of like what Joe forced on that slant. All right, there's no better person to talk to you about the linebackers than you. You play the position, you know, you know what it's all about. They they go out and they make the trade for for Ernest Jones, but before they made that trade, there, there's re, there's a reason why they went out and did that. What is it? What is it that they're trying to fill? What what are they? perceive lacking right now at that position um you know i think the the only difference between jones and baker that i see a little bit bigger of a guy a little more nastiness because i love baker i really he's just a little older so we got a little younger and 
he's a little healthier. Uh, Baker had to sit out a lot of off season with like Achilles and I think a shoulder. Mm-hmm. I was thoroughly impressed that a guy could sit out almost everything, come back week one, and he had the conditioning to still play like 50, 60 plays out of the 70. But, um, you know, we've asked a lot of T dot, you know, with the communication, wearing the green dot. And so, um, and then you can slide him over to Will now. I don't think a lot of people understand. This is something we, like we did. Well, you can only do this with a great player like, like KJ Wright. KJ Wright played Mike Sam and Will, and he called the defense from all three positions before. That is the mental gymnastics to do that is insane. But so with Ernest, I think it was just um, you get – Younger, healthier, and then just a little more attitude and size. He's a little bigger than um, than Baker, but I love Baker, and um, it's um, we'll see. I was thoroughly impressed with uh, Tyrese Knight, and so I thought this could be before they made a trade. I thought we were going to see more and more, you know, reps of him because man, he's got the complete game. Let's uh, flip it over to the the other side of the ball. A uh, lot has been made. I talked about it last few weeks. The body language of Gino. D- does is that concern you at all? No, I you know like unless the stats are not there to back up what he's doing. Because I mean, th- this is the last game was probably the toughest game he's had. Other than that, um, he's been and he was without DK. Uh, he was the leading rusher. Um, just things that I like to keep in you know in mind you know in view that when I factor in everything of like his performance. Leading rusher because he had no run game. We had 32 total rushing yards. Um, and then his his top weapon, one of his top weapons weren't out there. But um, his body language, you know, I think it's it hasn't been that bad because, okay, yeah, the, the slam in the head to the tablet, if that's anybody else, if that's Mahomes, oh, what a fiery competitor, right? You know, if it's anybody else, but if it's Geno who – has been through hell in his first seven, eight years, and then has done nothing but shine in his chance to be the starter. Two Pro Bowls, comeback player of the year, working on his third Pro Bowl. Um, you know, and he's doing all this when we statistically have not had a great defense and we haven't had a consistent run game because either our running backs have been hurt. We got two great running backs in in uh, Walker and Sharps. But then our O-line, the, even last year, I think they were healthy for the first game of the season. That was the first time. And then at halftime, we, when we lost to the Rams because they came back and just Puka Nakua took over, it was, it was, yeah, we didn't have a starting combination and he managed to keep us at 500 or better until we got healthy towards the end of the season. But he's had a winning record both times and there's not a many quarterbacks you could put back there with no run game and a not great defense statistically and they'll still produce nine and eight both times. Is it, uh, it- is it just the physical? You know, we talk a lot about the offensive line. I'm sure you have on your on your all day podcast about the offensive mm-hmm. line. Is it talent, nastiness? What is it that that it that it's lacking? Because it it hasn't been good for set. I mean, a long period of time. Because I I just feel this has been a, a talking point about their offensive line for ten years. Yeah. We're good. We're just never healthy. I and mean, if you're never healthy, you can't develop that chemistry um, that, you know, a true O-line needs. And so I remember when I got here, we had the greatest O-line. And, like, the craziest, scariest part was you would walk up to that line and they didn't have to talk, run or pass. Other than Robbie Tobik, hey, 5 one's the mic, 5 two's the mic. That's all they said. That's how well they worked together so that they knew, okay, under front, the, no- the nose is right here. Toback's going to scoop. Gray's going to go straight up. Like where other people are like, hey, combo, combo. They start talking and giving away what they're doing. As a defender, you better pick up to that language and hear like, bring it, bring it. Okay. Like, whereas you hear bring it. Yeah. He wants to double this way and then he's going to work up. If I hear that as a linebacker, I'm going straight downhill and peeling that guard. I'm tearing him in half. And like, that's... That's what you should be picking up on. So if you hear that, and like, that's what Chris Gray, Robbie Tobek, Sean Locklear, and then two Hall of Famers and Hutch and Walt, they didn't have to talk. It was complete silence. That's how great the understanding is. So the chemistry is everything. But um, also, what we're, the style of what we're asking to do, I just, I, we got some good athletes, and I would love to see them work up. I don't ever see them working up to the second level. Like, you see where people are giving us trouble. It's the zone blocking scheme where, you're going laterally to give a chip, but then you're going downhill. And this is going to open up two to three lanes for mm-hmm. great running backs like K9 and Sharps. And so right now there's 
I don't see anybody opening up a lane consistently, whether they're double teaming or anything. But if we just go man for man, someone's going to mess up on the defensive side. There's going to be one guy that's nosy and he just feels a bunch of space and goes back door for the space. And that's when K-9 is just going to turn on the burners. Uh, James Cook, there was four runs that he didn't get touched for the first seven yards. It was the zone blocking scheme. All they did was go straight up, right? And everybody was where they were supposed to be. But when you create levels, like a wave, there's two different tiers, right? Now you have to, it's like a maze. You have to navigate your way through. Like a guy like me, I love that. I would foot fake and then come back around and I would be untouched. But, um, you know, you're, you got to do it together. Otherwise you're creased. So um, it's, it's a chemistry thing and I think they'll figure it out. But yeah, the pass game's great. If we could just get the, you would think the run game, it, we're passing to open up the run, yeah. which is, which is crazy. Um, and I mean, I think the Niners, they were so screens and draws rarely work, right? It worked great against the Niners. It was 40 of our 50 yards rushing on four or five draws. They were not concerned with the run game at all. That's how little thought they gave to it. They're just running. We're going to run to Gino, and then we'll come back and get the running back if he has it. And it's just like against a fast, you know, unit like like the Niners, those those plays were. And then the quick screen was killing them. And so like Grub, to his credit, he was using using that as we came back. How do you? Uh, what, what's the key? What's the key against the Rams on, on Sunday? Obviously, they're, they're coming back healthy. You got yeah. Stafford. You got Nakua's back. You saw the impact that Puka can make on that team, and now you've got that deadly combo of Puka and Cooper Cup uh, together. How, how do they try and slow that down Sunday? Man, I am sick and unleashing the hounds on Stafford. I, you know, <laughs> he's, he's old. He's a great quarterback, but you know, he's. I'm not saying hurt him, but he's been hampered by injuries over the last few years, but I'm not letting him get comfortable, you know? And anyways, we, you know, we're going to have to have eight in the box to stop the run to start. I mean, yeah, Cup and Deku are back and they got a couple other weapons too. But if we sit back and we try to get cute in disguise, it's going to be a long day because this has got one of the guys like Gino with one of the quickest processors mentally. He gets the ball off. I know at their end, this is where you go with the ball. Like that's, He's got that kind of uh, processor mentally. And so um, just line up and let him know what you're in, but then just just bring that funk, man. You better get nasty and just hit all everything moving is what my assignment for the defense would be. Like, whether they got the or not. Yeah, there he is, guys. I mean, think about – I want you guys to all close your eyes and think about – if you were playing guard in the NFL and then you just and you hear Lofa go, I'm going to run straight down and tear that guy in half. Imagine that guy is you. Okay? Just imagine that. Imagine that guy screaming down and tearing your ass in half. I don't want to do it. I don't want to envision it. It would be scary as hell. Lofa Tatupa, you can follow him on, on Twitter, Lofa Tatupa51. Uh, catch out his, uh, catch his podcast, the All Day Podcast, that you can find on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. You've got Savage Brewery. Go check out Savage Brewery. 1937 Cannabis Farm. Go check. I mean, it just it's, doesn't matter. This guy's got everything. I'm jealous of you. Uh, Lofa, appreciate the time. Thank you. I'll bring you some samples. Oh, well, I, I'll, yes, please. Uh, again, you can catch this up uh, on YouTube. Uh, listen to it later on uh, Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. And, of course, One Stop Shop, always up at PuckSports.com.